Good evening, everyone. My name is Chris O'Flaherty, and on behalf of Oculus, I'd like to thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar, Clinical Pearls for Utilizing the Oculus Pinacam. Before we get started, I would like to point out that you have a text box on the lower right corner of your screen for asking questions, and I would encourage you to ask questions during the webinar, and we'll have a short Q&A session following the presentation. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Michael Bellin. Dr. Bellin is a professor of ophthalmology and vision science at the University of Arizona, Tucson. He has several publications on subjects ranging from corneal disease, refractive surgery, and the clinical application of elevation-based tomography. Dr. Bellin is the recipient of several awards, including the American Academy of Ophthalmology's Honor Award, their Senior Honor Award, and the Lifetime Achievement Award. It is uh, certainly an honor to have Dr. Bellin here tonight to share his insights and experience. So without further delay, I'd like to welcome Dr. Michael Bellin. Thank, thank, thank you, everybody. I'm going to first see if my uh, computer controls work. So what I'm going to be talking about this evening are really three separate topics. And it is, it is working. Most of you have heard me talk about ectasia detection, screening for refractive surgery, talking about subclinical keratoconus, post-LASIK ectasia, and pellucid marginal G generation. I'm going to start off with something that probably is of more general interest to most of you, and that is how I use the Pentacam with toric IOLs. Now, cataract surgery is not my major area of interest, uh, more corny and refractive, mm -hmm. but I find that I have, a, I would say, a relatively simplistic approach or practical approach for using the Pentacam for toric IOLs. And the main thing when doing toric IOLs is an underappreciation of the importance of axis and avoiding overcorrections. Now I want to compare how we evaluate our cataract patients to how we evaluate refractive sur 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 surgical patients. When we're evaluating a refractive surgical patient, we do a subjective refraction. We do a subjective refraction to determine best corrected vision and also to determine the subjective astigmatism, both magnitude and axis, because we assume our refractive patients really don't have any pathology. And that's what we're really screening. We're screening to exclude those that have pathology. We're dealing with really a normal population. We do an objective refraction, and again, to validate our subjective refraction and also determine magnitude and axis of the astigmatism. And we do a wave scan analysis, again, to determine a wavefront refraction and also to separate high order aberrations from low order aberrations. We use tomographic evaluation or the Pentacam really to rule out occult ectatic disease. We don't really use the Pentacam as much to determine the refractive status. We really use it to separate normal from abnormal. We're looking again to make sure we don't have irregular astigmatism. And the main reason we do tomography in our refractive surgical patients is to rule out occult ectatic disease. If we compare that to our cataract patients, it's very, very different. Again, our refractive surgery patients, the main thing that we use tomography or Pentacam for is to rule out occult disease. I'm talking about primary refractive surgery, not reoperations. If we look again at the Bell and Ambrosia display, which is what many of you might be using for your refractive screening, it again is designed to separate normal from abnormal. And we'll go over a little bit this, this later, but the Bell Ambrosian display looks at, if you look at the top left, the first column, that's anterior front ele ele elevation. The first map, the upper left, is using a standard best fit sphere. The middle uses something we call an enhanced reference surface, which we'll go over later. And the bottom one on the, on the first column represents the change going from the enhanced, going from the standard best fit sphere to the enhanced reference surface. And normalized really should have almost no change. And this clearly is a highly abnormal eye. 
with advanced keratoconus. If we look at the second column, the same thing, but on the posterior elevation. If we look at the upper right, we have a corneal thickness map, obviously abnormal, the thinnest point is 361. And those two graphs in the lower right are called pachymetric progression graphs, and they represent the rate of change of, of corneal thickness going from the thinnest point to the periphery. And again, these are all highly abnormal in this patient. And if you look at the final D, it's over 16 standard deviations outside the norm. If we now turn over to cataract surgery, things are really very, very different. We do a subjective refraction really just to determine the impact of the cataract. In other words, what's their best corrected vision? It's not a reliable indicator for the astigmatism because it's affected by the cataract. The same thing is true for an objective measurement, whether it's an autorefractor. The autorefractor, again, will be influenced by the cataract. We can't do wave scan analysis again for the same way you can, but you can't do it to determine the amount of astigmatism that you want to correct, and you can't use it to determine low water and higher aberrations, again, because they're all influenced by the cataract. We do tomographic evaluation, not so much to rule out occult disease, but to evaluate for irregular astigmatism. And really the most important point is to determine the source and magnitude of the astigmatism that we're going to try to correct. This is very, very different than what we do with our refractive surgery patients. So cataract surgery evaluation, we do both subjective and objective refractions, but they measure the total optical system. It measures the anterior cornea, the posterior cornea, and the lens, and the lens is cataractus. So again, we have no way to, to really know what, what the innate astigmatism of the system is. Since the lens is being removed, we need to be able to measure the corneal component only. And the older technologies, whether it was keratometry, video keratoscopy, the eyewell master, at least the original eyewell master, only measured the anterior component. So you really need anterior segment topography to determine a full evaluation. That could be Scheinfluger OCT. My preference for, for measuring, not for imaging, but for measuring is Scheinflug. Now again, tomography is needed for a full evaluation to determine again the anterior curvature, whether it's whether sagittal or tangential, but both the anterior and the posterior. But what's really important is not just the anterior curvature and the posterior curvature, but what's called the total corneal refractive power. That incorporates both anterior and posterior corneal surfaces, but also lens thickness and uses ray tracing to produce, again, a total corneal refractive power. So it's not just good enough to know the front surface and back surface. You really have to know the relationship between the two, the corneal thickness, to determine the total corneal refractive power. Again, that separates the total eye astigmatism, which is influenced by the lens. So again, total corneal refractive power is just that component produced by the cornea itself. Now, most of us use, and I'll say I, I, I do and I do with my residents, use a standard IOL toric calculator supplied by the manufacturer of the lens. These, however, have, were never designed to incorporate posterior data. So most toric IOL formulas attempt to compensate, just like the original IOL formulas did, they tend to compensate for not measuring the posterior corneal surface. And unless there is a very large difference, and I'll go over what I mean by this, between the anterior cornea, in other words, what you read, either anterior cornea, or IOL master, keratometry, versus the total corneal power, I use the anterior power because that's what the programs are designed to use. Again, they already incorporate a fudge factor. There are exceptions to this, and that's what's important, and that's what I'm going to get into later. The formulas, however, cannot compensate for an axis error, and that is extremely important. 
while for most cases I use anterior corneal power because again that's what the formulas were designed for with a fudge factor they can't compensate for an axis error so I always use the axis determined by the total corneal power not the anterior curvature axis I'm going to stress that again the formulas cannot compensate for an axis error they have a built-in fudge factor because they don't measure the posterior surface there's no way they can adjust for an axis misalignment due to the posterior surface. So I use the axis determined by the total corneal power. And this is the display I recommend, I use, I make my residents do on every cataract patient. And some of you may be very familiar with it. This map here is anterior sagittal curvature. This corresponds to what you would get on a video keratoscope, maybe what you get on a keratometer, an IOL master. This represents the total corneal refractive power. These are the three areas that are very important to look at. So this is SIMK. Again, it should match in most cases keratometry, IOL master pretty closely, K1, K2. And then this is the amount of BA astigmatism. This is mean. And then these numbers represent the axis. This represents the total corneal power. This is a very critical area. This is the axis difference between the total corneal refractive power and the axis determined by the anterior corneal surface only. This represents the difference between the magnitude of the astigmatism from the anterior surface to the posterior surface. I always use this determination of axis, the total corneal refractive power. In this case, you can see it's about an eight degree difference, which is sub substantial. As I said, most of the time, I will use the SIMK values again, because that's what the formulas are designed for, with certain exceptions. Now, if there's a difference, between the anterior versus the total corneal power, and we're talking about magnitude here, I use the anterior power again, as I said earlier, I said multiple times, because the formulas have a built-in fudge factor. They, they, they will not always match. There are exceptions. And that is, if the total corneal refractive power is less than the SIMK, when I say less, I'm usually talking about a half diopter or so, particularly in with the rule, I will tend to undercorrect the amount of astigmatism, not use, not use the full correction that's on the anterior surface. Why, why is, is, is that? And this is a very good example. You can see here the anterior value, again, is a mean of 4.2, the corneal total corneal power is 3.7. That's a half diopter. That's kind of my limit that when it when there's a half a diopter or more difference, I will tend to undercorrect based on this number. And the reason for that is, particularly in this example, that if I put a computation of 4.2, even though I know the total corneal power is 3.7, and end up with a slight overcorrection, I will flip axis and turn this patient into against the rule which is not very well tolerated. i rather leave someone with a slight residual astigmatism of with the rule than create someone who had with the rule and end up with a slight overcorrection of against the rule. So again, let me say it again. I normally use this, because again, the 4.2, that's what the formulas are based on. But if I notice that there's a difference of a half diopter or more, I will tend to go down a little bit on this number. And that's even more so if the patient is with the rule because an overcorrection will not be tolerated in this patient. An overcorrection of someone who's with the rule and you create against the rule astigmatism is typically not well tolerated. As I said before, I always use the axis based on the total corneal refractive power. So let's look at some examples here. So, here's an example where they're very, very close. 
So here we have the anterior surface is saying six diopters. The total corneal refractive power is saying 6.3. Not much of a concern for me. I'm less concerned when the total corneal is higher. And notice the axis is almost identical. So no real concern in this, in this patient. Notice here also another high cylinder, 4.2, 4.3, and absolutely no difference. Again, no real concern. And you'll notice this is high cylinder, but very reg reg regular cylinder. And again, here, the SIMKs and the total corneal refractive power are very close. And there's really no significant axis dif difference at all. Here is another set of examples. You'll notice here a huge amount of axis change, 35 degrees here and 19.2 degrees here. But look at the magnitude of the astigmatism, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 here, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, of no real significance. Just like when you refract a person, if, you're, if you try refracting someone who has a cord adapter or a cylinder, you'll get access all over the place. They'll, just, they'll kind of rotate the dial. It's the same thing really here. When the astigmatism is so low, the axis difference is really not clinically sig significant. In any case, none, none of us would normally put in a toric lens in this patient. Again, the magnitude is very low. But when you have very low levels of astigmatism, it's not uncommon to see significant differences between total and SIMK. And the reason for that is there's so little values, a slight difference in the back surface can change the axis substantially. But again, really not of any clinical significance here. So here, here we do have clinically significant magnitude change. So here you'll see again 4.4, 4.9, so a half diopter difference. As I said, I am less concerned if the total corneal power is higher. I know I'm not going to flip axis, but again, I may push, be a little more aggressive on, on this case. And you'll notice again over here, there's no significant axis difference. Here is another case worth discussing. The SIMKs show one diopter of astigmatism. The total corneal refractive power shows only a half and about eight and a half degree difference. It depends on what your, your entry level of astigmatism is for toric eye wells. I know for some people it's one and a half diopters, for some it's one and a quarter or one. This is a good example because while I use total, while I use the anterior value, sim k, in my formulas, I do use total corneal refractive power to determine if the person is a candidate for a toric IOL. So even if you may have, let's say, a one diopter criteria, even if I have a one diopter or even a one and a half diopter here, if my, if my number in total corneal is below one, I do not use a toric IOL. Again, so if I see a total corneal refractive power of astigmatism below one, I do not put a toric in, in that individual. And here you'll see some examples where we have very significant axis change. Here you'll see a 1.9 diopter on SIMK, a 1.8 on total corneal, so extremely close, well matched. But notice there's almost a 20 degree axis difference. That is huge. And I'll show you what, what influence that 20 degree axis deviation has shortly. So again, I use this to input, but I use the axis determined from total corneal refractive power. In this example, again, very close in magnitude, 1.2, 1.1, but again, almost an 11 degree axis change. So again, to summarize, let's see if we have a summary. Okay, you don't yet. The reason why axis is so important, and I've showed you examples of 10 and 20 degrees, is you'll get a 10% loss of effect with a three degree misalignment. That's basically within our degree of act, you know, just doing, doing a surgery. A 10 degree, which as I showed you one example had a 10 degree, is a 33% loss due to misalignment. A 15 degree is a 50% loss. And then I'm showing you an example here of 20, and you'll actually increase cylinder with a 30 degree misalignment. So axis alignment is actually more critical than magnitude because axis alignment will cause greater problems than magnitude. 
as long as you don't flip axis. So in summary, and I, I think my approach is fairly easy, and I, this is how I teach to my residents, is again, I use magnitude determined by the standard methods, which means K, I, Wellmaster, SIM K from the Pentacam, unless, and that is, if total corneal refractive power is significantly less, and I determine that by a half diopter or more, then I go down in power to avoid flipping axis. If total corneal refractive power is below the recommended toric Iowa level, regardless of the SIM K, I use a spherical lens. And axis orientation is always determined by the axis from the total corneal refractive power. So that's my kind of simplified approach to toric IOLs using the cataract display for, from the Pentacam. So I suggest, and we routinely do this with, with our residents, the routine use of the cataract pre-op display, not just for toric patients, I, I look at it for all patients, but particularly for toric patients, that I use, again, total coin and refractive power to determine the suitability for toric IOL and the total coin and refractive power for axis determination. With that, I think we're going to change subject into the things I more commonly talk on. And we're going to start off with a little bit about ictasia detection. I'm kind of doing things in reverse order because many of you have heard me just talk about keratoconus, et cetera. So I think we, we move some of that toward, towards the end. I get a lot of displays sent, sent to me. And one of the more common questions I get is, is this person acceptable for an enhancement? Is this a nictatic cornea? How can I tell? And we're going to go a little background real quickly. I'm sure most of you have, have heard this already. But when, when we look at that, we're, we're looking at elevation maps. And when we look at an ele elevation map, we're looking at the data against a reference surface. And the most commonly used, the one I routinely use, is a best fit sphere. And we take the best fit sphere from the central eight millimeters of the cornea. You can use other reference surfaces, but they're not nearly as intuitive. The reference surface is just there to allow us to make a visual inspection. And all of you have seen these displays before, that this is an astigmatic cornea, and this is the flat meridian. It's above the best fit sphere. And this is the steep meridian. It's below the best fit sphere. And you get what looks like for many people a similar pattern as you see on a curvature bow tie, but the, but the uh, colors are reversed because again, the flat meridian here is raised, so the positive numbers here, and the steep meridian here is below the best fit sphere. And this is the typical astigmatic pattern. A lot of times I'll get questions, well, I see a plus 26, is that abnormal, or minus 23? These numbers by themselves are secondarily important. If you have a normal astigmatic pattern, it's a normal map. These numbers only determine the magnitude of the astigmatism and the distance from the apex. If we back up a slide, you'll notice that as at the apex, both the steep and flat meridian are zero. But as we go further away from the apex, we get greater separation. The greater the astigmatism, the more rapid, rapid the steep and flat meridian will separate. So again, if you look at these numbers, you'll notice you draw any meridian, the numbers increase as we go out. And again, 26 here is indicative of the distance from the apex and the magnitude of the astigmatism. That number alone doesn't determine pathology. Compare this normal astigmatic pattern to this pattern, which is distinctly different, even though if you notice, the numbers are somewhat similar, plus 26, this is high, plus 30. But it's the pattern recognition that's important. We call this a positive island of elevation surrounded by a sea of blue. And I, I showed you why we get this type of pattern for an astigmatic cornea. So why do we get this type of pattern on a keratoconic cornea. Again, we call it a positive island of elevation surrounded by a sea of blue. Well, 
if we just take a cone, obviously no eye looks like this, but if we take a cone, a pure cone, and say, okay, how would that cone look like if I fit a best fit sphere to that cone? And this is what would happen. If I fit a best fit sphere to the cone, the best fit sphere will truncate the top of the cone. So you'll notice here, the highest points in the middle, which is what you see here. And you'll notice as you go down here, we get an immediate but very tiny transition from plus to minus. That's that thin green band, which is zero, right around here. And everything after that is below the best fit sphere, which is why it's blue. But notice the most negative is not in the far periphery. It's in the mid periphery right over here. And that's why you see the deep blue over here. So it's a positive ion of elevation. This point corresponds to here. The zero point here as a narrow green band surrounding the circle. And then a sea of blue where the deepest is actually in the mid periphery. Now, truth is you'll never see a map. This is actually a true patient, but you'll almost never see this because almost everyone that has a catech disease also has significant astigmatism. So we're looking for these positive islands that are actually superimposed on an astigmatic pattern. So what is subclinical keratoconus? Because really that's what we're screening for when we're screening for refractive surgery. Advanced keratoconus should be pretty obvious on slit lamp, on even video keratoscopy, on keratometry, but we're really looking for what's called, people used to use form first, I hate that term, subclinical disease. What does that mean? Subclinical is not suspect, it's true disease, but it's true disease that has not yet affected the anterior surface. And since the anterior surface contributes the bulk of the refractive power of the cornea, that's because again, the posterior cornea has a cornea aqueous interface. So it influences very little the overall refractive power. Patients can have significant posterior ectasias but still have basically normal vision. So subclinical disease is true keratoconus. It's not suspect. The corneas are abnormal. There's an abnormal posterior elevation. Notice here, we have a posterior, we have a positive island of elevation superimposed on, a, on an astigmatic pattern. But notice the anterior surface, completely normal. If we look at the corneal thickness map, you'll notice that if we just took an apical reading, it would also appear normal. But actually, the cornea thinnest point is located here, which corresponds to that posterior ectasia. So this is subclinical keratoconus. It's true disease. It's true pathology. But the patient retains good visual acuity. The patient is asymptomatic, which is why we call it subclinical. If you only looked at the anterior surface and only did a apical tachymetry reading using ultrasound, you would also think this patient is normal. And that's really the benefit and why it's really almost mandatory that we do full tomographic evaluation of our refractive patients. So these are all examples of subclinical keratoconus. Here again, you'll notice a posterior ectasia. You'll notice a very normal looking astigmatic surface. Here, I think this is the same example I just showed you before, a big posterior ectasia, a normal anterior surface. Here, you actually have astigmatic patterns on the both anterior and posterior surface, but it's really the pachymetric map that is abnormal. The thinnest point is significantly displaced here. Here we will see a very early anterior island, even though the curvature map appears normal, but notice again the posterior ectasia here, and notice again how the thinnest point is significantly displaced. So again, if all you looked at was the anterior surface and a central ultrasound, that would appear normal. Here again, a marked displacement in the thinnest point, and here again is a prominent posterior ectasia with a normal anterior surface. That's anterior elevation, a normal astigmatic pattern, posterior, sorry, anterior curvature, also normal, but a prominent posterior ectasia. Again, all these patients would have normal vision, would screen normally in older technology, but all have keratoconus, and all really are contraindicated for ablative treatment. So this is just a, a, a more blow up, a, a better picture of what is subclinical keratoconus. Again, a normal anterior curvature. 
You notice the elevation. You may have suggested maybe this is a little hint of an island, but actually within normal limits, but really a very prominent posterior ectasia. And again, you'll notice the displacement of the thinnest point. The thinnest point is displaced because, again, of this prominent posterior ectasia. So again, for those of you who are familiar with the Bell and Ambrosia display, this is a highly abnormal eye with a normal anterior surface. If you notice all the indices below, they're all red, they're all abnormal, except for the one for the front surface. And again, if you look at the anterior elevation, even with the enhanced reference surface, it is all within normal limits. And if you look at the difference, there's no significant change going from the enhanced to the best fit sphere. The anterior surface is normal. The back surface, highly abnormal. The corneal thickness map, abnormal, thin, but... And if you notice, the pachymetric tracing is also outside the 95% confidence interval. So again, and if we look at the final reading, it's almost six standard deviations outside the norm, a highly abnormal eye in an asymptomatic individual. So again, that's why we call this subclinical keratoconus. Okay. So again, I said I'm going to do things kind of in a backwards order. The enhanced reference surface that I've alluded to is something that we designed because we realized that when we use a best fit sphere, it actually averages not only the normal cornea, but also the pathology. So a best fit sphere in an eye with keratoconus, the best fit sphere is influenced by the ectatic region. What we really would like is a reference surface that more closely follows the more normal part of the cornea. Because if we do that, it'll allow the ectatic region to stand up higher. So again, this is what a standard best fit sphere does. But if we were able to get a, a reference surface that was not influenced by the ectatic region, it would, uh, it would allow the ectatic region, sorry, to stand up higher. And what we've done is we've taken the standard eight millimeter zone that we normally use to compute the best fit sphere. And we've excluded an area surrounding the thinnest point of the cornea. We call that the exclusion zone. So we, we take the standard eight millimeter zone that we always use for the best fit sphere, and we exclude an area surrounding the thinnest point. That area, that exclusion zone, actually is a complex computation that varies between anywhere from 3.0 to 4.0 millimeters, and that's based on proprietary calculation we do in the bad display. But for understanding, you can to say it's a four millimeter diameter. Most normal eyes will actually use a four, four millimeter diameter exclusion zone. When we exclude that area, it, it effectively has an effect of flattening the best fit sphere if the eye was abnormal. It has very little effect on normal eyes. And again, the purpose of that is to take a best fit sphere here that's influenced by the ectatic region and create a shape that looks more like this. And when we do that, we, with eyes that have ectasia, we go from this map to this map, a big increase in the elevation. When we do that in normal eyes, because normal eyes do not have a significant ectatic region, there is almost no change when we look at the normal best fit sphere to the enhanced ref reference surface. And here's an example. So let me explain what all these circles are. So this is, we're only showing a nine millimeter zone. So this is a nine millimeter optical zone. This is the eight millimeter. This is how we normally compute the best fit sphere. We use all the data within the eight millimeter zone. This is just a pupil. And if we look at that, we recognize an astigmatic pattern, but we also see this area right here that looks like maybe an early positive island. If we then compare the appearance of this map using the enhanced reference surface, again, this is the eight millimeter zone, so we're using everything within the eight millimeter zone, but this circle is that exclusion zone. So we remove this area from the calculation, and notice what happens to what was a difficult island to see, 
becomes extremely easy to see this positive island. A big change going from here to here. So again, that's the benefit of using the enhanced reference surface. Here's another example again. I think most of us probably wouldn't miss this, but this is using the standard best fit sphere, and this is the enhanced reference surface, obviously more prominent. And while I think no one would miss it on the posterior surface, notice that it goes from 60 to 87. Again, it becomes more elevated, more prominent, and for mild cases, much, much easier to see. When we do the same thing with normalize, you'll notice there's almost no, no change. So the best fit sphere, when we remove an exclusion zone in normalize, undergoes very little change. And you'll notice here that, again, this is the standard best fit sphere. This is the enhanced reference surface. This is standard. This is the enhanced reference surface. Really no significant change. And that's important because what you don't want to do is you don't want to create false positives. When we actually looked at what the change was going from the standard best fit sphere to the enhanced reference surface, it turns out that, that the magnitude of that change was highly statistically significant, separating normalized from ab abnormalized. And that's really a big part of what the left side of the uh, bad display is. Normalized showed very little change only on the order of about two microns on the anterior surface, while ectatic eyes showed about 20 microns of change. And the posterior surface was even more prominent. Normal eyes had less than three microns of change when abnormal eyes had roughly 40 microns of change. So it turns out that that change, when we compare the map from a standard best fit sphere to enhanced, is highly significant for separating normal from abnormal eyes. And graphically, you, you can see that here. The green is the change in the anterior, the first column, the change in the anterior at the apex. The second is the anterior at the maximal point of change. The third is the posterior at the apex. The fourth is the posterior at the maximal change. And green is normalized and red are cones. And you can see again that there is a huge difference between the two. And it turns out that that was again very effective at separating normal from abnormalized. So the Bell and Ambrosia display, again, evaluates both the anterior and posterior elevation using both a standard and an enhanced reference surface. It gives you then what the difference is. One of the benefits of the display is that all the scales and colors are fixed. So once you get used to it, you should be able to do a really rapid screening in, in seconds. I can look at the map because I don't have to look at the numbers because the colors and the scales are all fixed, and I, I can screen a patient very, very rapidly. The right side is all the pachymetric data. We give you, the, again, the corneal thickness map, the pachymetric pro progression graphs, and the other important thing, and I think my next slide will show you that. Let's see. No, it doesn't. Okay is it lets you know when the map is not reliable. And I will uh, I believe we'll show that in a, in a slide or two. So these are the pachymetric progression graphs, which are the work by Renato Ambrosia. And to simplify these, I normally only pay much attention to the second one. Which is, they, they tell you the same thing. This is just easier to explain and interpret. This is called the, the percentage thickness increase. And what it does, it tracks the change in thickness from the thinnest point to the periphery. And while it sounds backwards, keratoconic eyes abnormal have a more rapid thickening. It's more, it's more logical to say the opposite, and that is if you start in the periphery, it thins more rapidly as you go to the thinnest point. And this is an example of the value of those maps. These are two corneas where the center, in other words, if you just did an ultrasound, would have the same central ap apical reading. But notice this tracing here is outside the normal level, and this tracing is right down the middle. Well, this is a normal but thin cornea. This is an abnormal eye that is, is most likely ectatic. So again, this is the 95% confidence interval. That's the mean, upper and lower, 95% confidence interval. If the change is more rapid, the, the graph dips down below. So as you can see the red tracing here, it is below. This is an abnormal tracing. 
while this I with the same, quote, apical reading has a completely normal tracing. If you look at another tracing here, you'll notice the graph, the tracing is flattened, it's above. You'll normally see that in eyes that have corneal edema, because corneal edema usually the greatest effect is in the central part of the cornea, and you lose the normal transition. So you get actually a less change from going from the center to the periphery. And you can see that here, there's almost no change as you go from the center to the periphery. Here there is still change, but notice the tracing is above. When you see these type of tracings, you really should look closely at the endothelium in, in, in that patient. I'm going to skip by some of these slides <clears throat> just for reasons of time. <clears throat> Excuse me. The BAD3, which is the current, has a number of more parameters, but on the BAD2, two, two, we, we introduced five parameters, and we report the parameters in standard deviations. I think it's important to understand that each individual parameter in itself doesn't have predictive value. So don't be concerned if you see one yellow or one red. It's only really the final overall reading that has pre predictive value. So this again is the final overall reading. You may have a single red here and have a normal reading. You may have all whites here and have a yellow here if all these are borderline. This has predictive value. This has been validated. These are just standard deviations based on a normal pop population. The, I always use the example of glaucoma. If you have someone who comes into your office with a pressure of 22, yes, that's outside of, quote, the 95% confidence interval. They have a cup to this of 0 0.1, no field, no family history, and a normal nerve fiber layer. You have a yellow for pressure. They don't have glaucoma. So don't overread any of the individual parameters. Again, this is the important. It's the global reader of the, of the map. So again, just a couple examples. Looks like a relatively normal eye. Notice everything here looks pretty normal. Central pack of 526. There's a little yellow on the pachymetric progression. You can see it's just hovering on, on the lower limit, and that gives us a final reading that's slightly outside the normal range because pachymetric progression is a fairly heavily weighted parameter. This is, this is the one I was referring to before. This confusing display is important to understand because it lets you know a very important point. This number here and here represents the area that have been utilized to determine the best fit sphere. If you remember I told you, back up a slide here, that we use the eight millimeter optical zone. So that you'll see here, this says diameter 8.0. This is the actual radius of curvature of that best fit sphere. This represents the area that was used to compute it. We want to use an eight millimeter zone. It lets you know if you don't have adequate coverage. Notice it's a big red box here. It says 4.54 here and 5.17 here. It's telling you you don't have enough coverage to get an eight millimeter zone for the best fit sphere. You're only getting 5.17 on the front surface and 4.54. It's not reliable. It will turn yellow if you have less than eight and will turn red at less than 7.5. I will tell you from lots of experience, I've never really seen a problem with yellow if you have at least 7.5, but if you have a red, you need to repeat the image. None of this will be reliable if you, if you don't have the, the, the area to compute the best fit sphere. There'll be some cases where you just, whether the patient has ptosis, not cooperative, whatever, that you may never be able to get at least 7.5. If you can't, be aware that if you look at the pachymetric progression here, as long as you see a solid line, that's reliable data. Once you see it broken up on here, that you can't rely on. But we couldn't get a good coverage on this patient because the eye was so abnormal. And you'll notice the pachymetric progression here up to this point is well outside the normal range. So we knew this patient was so abnormal anyhow. It wasn't really a question whether they were going to have a surgery or not. But again, 
for most normal patients, you should be able to get at least 7.5 and optimally 8 millimeters. If you see a red box here, this part of the map is not reliable, and you should instruct your technician to repeat the image. So this is the current version, which is version 3. Uh, there's a, a number of new parameters, so we, we don't have room to put all the parameters on the bottom, but you'll notice, you probably can't read it, this is a front elevation at the thinnest, back elevation at the thinnest, this is a progression index, this is a term called ART. All these are reported the same way in standard deviations. So again, yellow if it's outside of 1.16 deviations, and red if it's outside of three standard deviations. So the current release, we added a number of new parameters to the regression analysis. Still, it is the overall final reading that has predictive value. So this is, I think, what most people always ask me. Well, what, what are my normal parameters? And I will tell you typically what I use, and that's what I can say. The final D is the only parameter that has prognostic value. So right off the bat, I rarely do surgery on patients less than 20 years of age. We're talking here um, mostly LASIK. And if, if I do, it really is only those that required for occupational needs. For patients less than 30 years, I typically use an upper limit for the final D of 1.6. Let me say it again. For patients in their 20s, I'm concerned with a final D of greater than 1.6. That's in either eye. For patients in their 30s or less than 40, I use an upper limit of 2.0 on a final D. And for patients above 40, I'll go up to 2.25 as a final D. If one eye is abnormal, obviously the patient should be considered abnormal. It's not, well, I only treated one eye because that eye had a normal D. It's, if one eye is abnormal, the eye is abnormal. I don't have hard and fast rules, but there's more leeway for surface, surface ablation. Also, high asymmetry is an added risk, and we have some stuff that would be published shortly, a, a lot of work done by Mu Maria Enriquez from Peru, but let's, let's take uh, that 20-year-old patient, someone in their 20s who has a D of 1.55, so it's below 1.6. So if it's 1.55 in one eye and 0 0.9 in the other eye, that may be a little more disconcerting for me. So I always look for asymmetry in corneal thickness readings, in overall symmetry of the eyes, in asymmetry of the final Ds. But these are my general guidelines. I use general because obviously other things are always taken into consideration, the depth of the ablation, family history, et cetera. But these are kind of my general guidelines for using the bad display. We have a few minutes left. So how do we determine post-operative ectasia. The problem really is if you want to know if something abnormal has happened post-ablative surgery, you can't look at the anterior surface. It's been surgically altered. Um, changes on the anterior surface for post-LASIK ectasia are late. You don't want to wait to that point. You can't look at the pachymetry map because we've thinned the cornea. If you look at, a, a, again, the anterior surface, pre- and post-op, it will have changed. If you look at the corneal thickness map pre- and post-op, it would have changed. The posterior surface should not change significantly, whether it's post-PRK or post-LASIK. So if all I have is a map that looks, someone sends me a map here, okay? Well, you notice the flat area on the anterior surface because the person had, had, had an ablation. Notice the thin cornea, again, all expected. But notice here, there's a, posterior, a positive ion level elevation on the posterior surface. That is abnormal. The problem is what I don't know, I can say the map is not normal. What I can say is whether it's post lysic acacia or it was a pre-existing subclinical keratoconus that was missed, unless I have preoperative data. So if I'm only given a single map here, I can see this is abnormal, but I can't know if it's, if it's basically a subclinical condition that was missed or post-lasic occasion. 
The best way is if we have preoperative data. And the best way to screen for post-LASIK ectasia is to compare pre- and post-operative posterior corneal elevation. Because again, the posterior surface doesn't undergo any significant change after ablative treatment. And by convention, I tend to put the more recent map here and the pre-op map here. The only reason for that is that if there's an ectasia, I, that ends up with a positive number here. And you'll notice when I put the current map here and the pre-op map here, there's absolutely no change. It's all green. So this, this is a completely normal eye. Well, it's a normal post, post lace, lace, lace a guy. If we compare that to this map here, current pre-op, and you'll notice that this is probably a missed case right here, but notice this map here, that's the area of the ectasia. So this is an abnormal map. Clearly that looks very different than that, that that's, that's all green. So this is indicative of post lasik ectasia. Again, the, the least a suggestion here, since this is the pre-op, that this may have been a, a missed sub, subclinical case, but here clearly you can see that there is changes undergoing on the posterior surface. A lot of times people will send me, the, the, again, the bad display, Bell and Broge display, and ask me, is it okay for an enhancement? The Bell and Broge display was designed for preoperative evaluation. It looks at the preoperative map against a large database of normal eyes. It really isn't designed, it's not meant for a postoperative evaluation. There's only one part of the display that if you don't have preoperative data that you can look at, and that's this. Because the anterior surface, as I said, is surgically altered. The corneal thickness is altered, so clearly all these tracings will be abnormal. This is the only part of the map that you can look at postoperatively and determine if there's a hint of a posterior ectasia. And you'll see again, it's abnormal. But what you can't tell again is whether this is a post lasik ectasia or a missed subclinical keratoconus, but you can at least know if the case is normal or, or not. <clears throat> and I think I will end at this point because um, we only have a few minutes left and I know that uh, Chris mentioned before that if anyone wants to ask any questions to type, type, type them in. Uh, so I will stay on the line for a few few minutes, and actually I'll just flip through. I think Chris had a few slides right at the end that he wanted to uh, show here, and that is just a um, past webinar as he found on the Oculus webpage. And Chris, do you want to take over to see if we have any questions? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so yes, and. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Belling. Um, so this is our website here. Uh, you can view past webinars. I noticed that a few of you joined mid-webinar. So if you missed something and you would like to see the rest of this, uh, we will have it posted to our website within a couple weeks. If you have any questions or, or comments about the Pentacam or uh, would like to request a product demonstration, you can email us at sales at oculususa.com or you can call us at our phone number here, which is 425-670-9977. And uh, yes, Dr. Bellin, I do have a couple questions for you here. Um, the first question is, when comparing two posterior elevation maps, uh, pre and post LASIK, for Ectasia, do you rec recommend changing the best fit sphere reference numbers yeah. so both maps are yeah. using the yeah. same best fit sphere radius? Okay. Good, good, very, very good question. If you're doing a study, or if you're going to be publishing a paper, the answer is yes. And most people don't know how to do that. Uh, when you go to the compare to, uh, you know, let me back up. Uh, let me give you control, control again. Control. Yeah, yeah. Give yeah. me one second here. Give me control. Or you can back up a couple. Oh, seconds. go ahead. So go ahead. You have it now. It's easy. There you go. Uh, I'm not getting it to anything. Okay, I'll just back up for you here. Okay. Back up till we have one of the compare two exams, which is backed up quite quite a bit. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Right there, stop. All right here. Okay, that, that's fine. Okay, so problem yeah. Can can you can they all see my cursor now? It's okay. Okay. So this is the display compared to exams. Again, current pre op 
normally you don't have to do this, but if you, again, you probably can't read it, but you'll notice that the best fit spear actually is a little bit different between the two. And if you put your cursor over here and right click, it'll open up a drop down box. And in that box, there'll be a check off that says something along the line, keep best fit sphere constant. And you should check that so that you're using the same reference surface. It really isn't needed for just screening whether you have a problem or not. But if you really actually want to do sequential things over time, then it, then it becomes important. But normally, don't even worry about it. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have a question going back to the toric calculations. Do you ever use the total coronal refract refractive power for against the rule astigmatism or oblique astigmatism? Yes. Oh, oh good. okay. Um, I don't use it in, in that f fashion, as I said, I, um, because the formulas, again, compensate, at least they try to compensate. And my biggest concern is avoiding an overcorrection. So most of the time, if the two match, it doesn't really matter what you use. As I said, if the total corneal is less, and within a half diopter, I'll use the anterior value. If the total cornea is significantly less, regardless of axis, but particularly uh, with the rule, because if you overcorrect, you'll flip. Uh, but if I have a, a total corneal that is more than a half diopter greater than the um, anterior, I will be a little more aggressive. I, I probably can't give you a big number for that, but I probably get a little more ag aggressive and uh, and going to the next lens up. But in general, I'm less concerned about an undercorrection and more concerned about avoiding an overcorrection. And that's regardless of the axis orientation. The biggest concern for me with, with the overcorrection, however, as I said, is people who are you know close to with the rule because flip, flipping those will make them very sim symptomatic. Okay. Thank you. Now, with that, I tell you, that's partly because if, if I was a huge, and I'm not, a huge cataract surgeon and was able to generate huge numbers, I would be able to kind of generate something similar to a surgeon factor for torax. Where, and there are formulas where you can actually input both anterior and posterior value. Um, I deal with a lot of residents. We don't have consistency. Uh, so I, I use a very simplistic approach. I think for most people would suit them very, very, very well. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have uh, just a couple more questions, if, if that's okay, if you have time. Go, yep. Uh, how much change in the posterior cornea contraindicates a second treatment? Oh, um, you should not have anything more than, you know, I'm going to have to go back and look at the paper we wrote, but it's usually two, two or three microns is within measurement noise. Okay, so basically outside of the tolerance of the instrument. But yeah, but you know what? It's 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 looking at the picture I showed you that was quote normal. Actually, it's the one that's on the screen. If you look at that, there are and again, I have to apologize because the quality is not great. There are numbers you'll notice, you know, one, two, and threes. But it, it's I told you before, numbers are less important than just kind of the global. That's a normal pattern. It's really the the pattern also. And when you have a posterior ectasia, you will see a post. You you will see an abnormal pattern. But again, uh, from numbers, particularly if it's in the center, uh, you should not see anything more than about two or three micron change. And here, if you look right in that central area, uh, it looks like mostly zeros and ones. Okay. Um, I have actually just one last question here. Um, do you have a similar age-related guideline for the final D regarding PRK? Um, I would love to say yes, but I have to be honest with you, and that is I actually really like PRK. Unfortunately, my optometrist and my referring base doesn't. So the volume of PRK that we do, which I wish was higher, is not – high enough for me to really come up with those numbers. In addition, we tend to do PRK on patients 
that we feel are contraindicated for, for LASIK. So it's a skewed pop population. Uh, so I gotta be honest with you and say, I don't have kind of that strict criteria that I do have for LASIK. I will say that clearly there are the borderline cases that I may not do LASIK, I'm very comfortable doing on, on surface. Um, with that, a, a final D value of 2.25 and above um, is a major concern regardless of, of me for anyone that's, let's say, 40 and below. And a value of 2.7 and above is a contraindication for me to do anything. Okay. Well, I think that about wraps it up. Um, thank you again, Dr. Bellin, for your okay. time and for your, all your clinical insights. And, uh, Not a problem. I'll put the um, contact information back up here on the screen for Oculus, and I wish everybody a good night. Thank you. Okay, I will take, take care. Good night, everybody.